Good morning. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning as we gather for worship and we welcome you who are joining us online. We're glad that you're here today. Let's open our service with a word of prayer today. Father in heaven, as we come before you, we ask for open hearts that you may speak to us, that you may search us, that you may do a new work in us. We honor you today and we offer this time of worship to you in the name of Jesus, our King and Savior. Amen. And amen. And good morning. Good morning. All right. So we're going to sing uh, Majesty Worships His Majesty. Take a quick breath and then jump right into His Name is Wonderful. So one time through each. So be ready. If you would stand, let us sing together. Majesty Worship His Majesty and His Name is Wonderful. You'll find it in the bulletin. of Christ. We're glad you're here today. Amen. You can be seated. Well, Pastor Honey, I'm glad to be here today. Well, Uncle Chester, I'm, I'm glad that you're here today. Tell me, I, what were you doing last week? I saw you working on something. Oh, that, that was my genealogy, my, my family tree. And I, and I made some amazing discoveries. Amazing discoveries? What, what, what did you discover? 
Pastor Ronnie, did you know that I am royalty? You may bow to me. Well, I'm, I'm not going to bow to you, Uncle Chester, but um, what, what do you mean royalty? Uh, undescended from the king of Lithuania. I, I don't even know where Lithuania is. Well, I think it's over in Europe somewhere. So you're, you're descended from one of the royalty in Lithuania. That must be exciting. Well, I thought it was until I told my friends over coffee. Well, they weren't impressed? Well, one of them said he did his genealogy and, and he was related to the king of England. And another one was related to a, a princess in France. And so I realized it doesn't mean anything. We're all royalty. Well, you know, that's kind of true. I, ha I have found that a lot of people's genealogies, one way or another, lead back to an emperor some way. But I just, I want to stop you for just a minute because I'm royalty. Oh, no, not you too. Yeah, yeah, I am, I am. And uh, let me guess, you're, you're related to the king of uh, Italy. No, 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 no better than that. Well, uh... Uh, the king of Australia. Well, Australia doesn't have a separate king. They, they, they still connected in Commonwealth with, with England. What, what you, no, no, no. You, it's some, something even bigger than that. Well, uh, well, is it going to get you any money? No, no, no money. No inheritance. If direct as far as money goes. Listen, we're royalty because we're connected to Jesus. Jesus, how come? Well, because Jesus is the king and he's adopted us into his family and we're now children of the king when we say yes to him. So I'm royalty too. Yes, and it isn't just because of the king of Lithuania. It's because of Jesus living in your heart. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the grace that comes from knowing you and being adopted into your family. We honor you and we're so grateful for the great work you do in our hearts. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat>
that we must put our trust in Thee if we would be free. Heal our land, please help us find our way, for in Thy Word we find our strength if we look up each day. Heal our land, and fill us with Your love, keep us upon the path of truth that comes from heaven above. Heal our land, heal our land, and guide us with thy hand. Keep us ever on the path of liberty. Heal our land, heal our land, and help us understand that we must put our trust in Thee if we would be free. Protect us by the power of Thy rod and keep us as one nation under To thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God. understand that we must put our trust in thee oh may we put our trust in thee lord help us put our trust in thee that we may Thank you, Kevin and Leon. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. I made a misprint in the bulletin. That was my error. And so actually we're going to be in Luke chapter 3. And um, if you should also want to have ready Matthew chapter 1. Luke chapter 3. And I want to begin reading in verse 23. As he began his ministry, Jesus was about 30 years old and was thought to be the son of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Mathak, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Janai, son of Joseph. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, the internet has opened up a whole new world for many people. In some ways, there's some pretty bad stuff out there, but on the other hand, there's some really good things that people are finding more and more helpful and enjoyable. For instance, one of the things that people really seem to be enjoying is the study of their genealogies. 
It's amazing the stuff that people can look up and is now available online. In some cases, I could look up a member of my family tree, a people I may have never heard of before. I can find out where they lived and where they're buried, and in some cases, even the plot number in the graveyard. Only a fraction of this kind of information would, been a, would have been available to us when I was growing up. In fact, it seems like when I was growing up, not that many people worked on and studied their genealogies beyond the stories that grandma and grandpa told around the Thanksgiving dinner table. But that seems to have changed now. More and more people want to examine, build on, and know their family tree. I once read a blog posting by a man who was writing an article on genealogies, and so he posted a question on his discussion board. Why do you do genealogies? And he was overwhelmed with the responses. The answers frequently talked about an obsession or being hooked. People sought understanding of ancestors who fought in wars. Adopted people wanted to know more about their family of origin. People discovered cousins and even siblings that they never knew they had. Life stories were filled in. Family trees gave purpose. It helped you know who you are. It answers questions like why and who and where. And I'm finally realizing that genealogies are becoming today almost as important as they were in the days of the Bible. Genealogies have been the lifeblood of God's people for centuries. And lots of genealogies are found in the Bible. The ones in Genesis told how God's people came to be. The ones in the book of Numbers recorded after leaving 400 years of slavery in Egypt told them that each person matters because each person got counted. We are now a people of God. The genealogies of the kings established bloodlines for royalty. And the genealogies after coming back from the Babylonian captivity were designed to reestablish forgotten ancestry. And then we get to Jesus. His genealogies are the last ones in the Bible. Almost as if now that we're at the one that belongs to Jesus, we have all that we need. The genealogies of Jesus are presented in two places in the New Testament. And in fact, they don't match up perfectly. And that deeply bothers many people with our modern scientific mindset. The traditional explanation is that one of the genealogies probably represents Joseph's family and the other represents Mary, even though there's no direct evidence for this. The real answer may be much more simple and practical. For example, I think part of the problem is that we modern people impose our modern expectations on the way ancient people thought about things. For example, one of the explanations for the differences in the genealogies is that contrary to the way things are done today, ancient peoples often did not try to list every last person in a family line. Sometimes they skipped people, even lots of people. The point was often to hit the highlights. And I know, I know some of you are thinking there's a few family members I'd like to skip over as well. Maybe you're like that. Secondly, the reality of half brothers and half sisters and multiple marriages and stepchildren. Friends, that's nothing new. That's been going on since the dawn of humanity. And just because we modern people want to include every last possible variation in a family tree, that does not mean that ancient peoples wanted to do the same thing. 
I mean, just think about that biblical practice that is very foreign to us, that's very strange. The one that says that when a man dies before he's had any children, then it's up to his brother to provide the widowed sister-in-law with children. And so once that happens, how are you now going to count the children? By the brother, the, the, the one who is the natural father, or by the dead man, since the whole point of this action was to continue the line of the dead man. How do you count it? Well, the bottom line is, friends, we simply don't have enough information to explain the differences in the genealogies of Jesus. And while some people will make a hugely big deal about what may be perfectly explainable if we had the information, I confess I wonder if this might be why the Apostle Paul warned the early church, not once, but twice, to be careful about being obsessed with endless genealogies, as he called it. In his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes, Nor, Timothy, give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in the faith. 1 Timothy 1, 3-4. Friends, rather than getting caught up in endless, unprofitable arguments that have no solution, I'd rather focus on the truth that is simply presented to us. The genealogies of Jesus are a portion of Scripture that most people just skip over. They gloss over it and give very little thought to it. And I must confess to you this morning... I toyed with the idea of beginning this sermon by reading an entire genealogy. And about halfway through, I would just stop and then say, is anybody still listening? And then I would ask, is there at least one person in this room who had the thought enter your mind? Oh my gosh, is he going to read the whole thing? Friends, instead of completely ignoring the genealogies of Jesus, we ought to at least ask, why are they there? And what are we supposed to gain from them? And I have a few suggestions for you. First of all, I want you to notice that this is a human genealogy. The genealogies attempt to show that Jesus was a real man, not a myth, not a fairy tale with fictional characters, with the Gospels being written down in document form only about 30 or so years after the death of Jesus. It's as if to say, hey reader, here is his family. You can go to Israel. You can talk to relatives who are still alive today. Jesus was a real man. Matthew goes one step further. To focus on Jesus as a pure Jew, tracing his lineage back to Abraham. In fact, the genealogy of Jesus in Luke goes from Jesus all the way back to Adam. As if to focus on the fact that God Almighty took on flesh and became one of us. In fact, since Luke wrote his gospel for a mostly Gentile audience, that may have been his purpose in tracing the genealogy all the way back to Adam. The truth that Luke was lifting up is Jesus came to be the Savior of us all, not just the Jews. Now, this may seem like not such a big deal to you, but that's because you live in a modern age. Where people, while people are still people, no matter in what time period they live, the burning issues of society change. Today, very few people question whether Jesus was a man, a human being. The burning question for some today is whether or not he was God. In all my years as a pastor, I have never had a church member, not even one, who came and questioned me whether Jesus was a man. 
But I have had a few who came and questioned whether he was really God Almighty. It is the divinity of Jesus that is the burning issue for many lives today. But 2,000 years ago, in the days of the early church, the problem may have been exactly the opposite. In a day when most people in the world believed in lots and lots and lots of gods, the Greeks and the Romans had gods everywhere. Many people apparently had less of a problem believing that Jesus was a God. The bigger problem that tended to infect the early church was actually believing that he was a human being. That Jesus was God Almighty who took on real human flesh. The Gnostics an early group of heretics in the early church, they just could not handle this. They believed that salvation came to us through special knowledge and secrets. It was a mental kind of a thing. And some of them taught that Jesus, to use a modern terminology, Jesus was really a hologram that is kind of, kind of a projection from heaven, but he wasn't really here, not in the flesh. The idea that God Almighty bleeding and dying on a cross in the flesh for the salvation of lost people was absolutely unthinkable to the Gnostics. And friends, if you do not have a dying, bleeding Savior, then it's no surprise that the Gnostics tended to not talk about the resurrection very much either. So now you can begin to see why a genealogy was so important in the early church. Joseph may not have been Jesus' real father, but Mary was his real flesh and blood mom. And Joseph was his adoptive father. Jesus was a real man. He was God in the flesh. But there's a second truth that these genealogies lift up. It was a royal genealogy. Jesus was from the royal line of King David. And that establishes his credentials to be the Messiah. The Messiah was prophesied to come from the royal line. But more than that, God made a promise to King David in ages past that David would have a descendant on an everlasting throne. Jesus is the son of David, his descendant, the one to whom the throne belongs. But there's more in these genealogies, friends. Thirdly, they are grace-filled genealogies. Both of the genealogies in Luke and Matthew are filled with broken, sinful people who found the grace and the mercy of Almighty God in powerful ways. From Abraham, who discovered salvation by faith. To David, who found the grace of God to conquer enemies and also found forgiveness for deep sin and brokenness in his life. To Zerubbabel, who desperately needed God's grace in the chaos of rebuilding and restoration after the Babylonian captivity. These genealogies are a, a living testament to the grace of God in people's lives, often in very troubled times. But Matthew's gospel goes one step further. Friends, it's, it's no secret that in this day and age, these ancient genealogies were all about following the male bloodline. So in Matthew, it's rather unusual that we find the names of some women in the genealogy of a Jew named Jesus. 
This was not normal. It was not a typical practice. And so the presence of these women should cause you and I to stand up and take notice. We find the name of Tamar in Matthew 1 verse 3, who was the widow and was commended when she stood up for herself and took action when others in her family disobeyed the law of God and neglected their responsibilities. We find the name of Rahab in verse 5. She was a foreign Canaanite Gentile and a prostitute who helped the spies in the days of Joshua and found God's grace in her life. He delivered her from her past and she became part of the people of God. And she's in the lineage of Jesus. And in verse 5, we find the name of another Gentile foreigner, Ruth. She was a woman of Moab who found grace and redemption from the great grandfather of King David. We also find Mary's name, the mother of Jesus, who found grace in the eyes of her betrothed Joseph. And of course, grace from God, who had chosen her for an impossible seeming mission. There's this almost unspoken message that reverberates through these genealogies, friends. And it's this, grace is available to all who say yes to Jesus. Transformation is available to all who will leave their sin and their brokenness behind. New life awaits those who surrender and say yes to him. To the God who became a man so that he might die and rise again. May he bring hope and everlasting life to those who say yes to him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, forgive us when we have just, our eyes have glazed over and we have missed the truth that you have presented for us in pages of scripture. I thank you for your love and your faithfulness that people, ancient people long ago felt it was so important to record this part of scripture for us today. And as we begin to open our eyes, we hear your voice and sense the depth of something special here. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, to be a surrendered people. We hear and see in the pages of these genealogies the call and the invitation of grace. And we can begin to say, if you could change their lives, you can change ours too. To your honor and glory. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, who is the King, and all God's people said, Amen. Let us now stand and sing together hymn number 189, Fairest Lord Jesus.
will please remain standing as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let's join our hearts for a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we come to you in worship to a, to a place here in this sanctuary or watching at home, we, we come to a place where we still our spirits. We offer these moments to you as an expression of our love and our worship. To hear you speak to us. We want to have open ears, Lord. We want to have willing hearts. We want to have a spirit about us that is one of gentleness and love and a sensitivity to your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would search us, Lord, and, and try us and show us things within our own lives. And sometimes we even try to hide from ourselves. We gloss over. We cover them with the rug of our heart. But Lord, you have this way of lifting things, of placing your finger on areas of our lives. And we pray that we would have the courage to say yes to you, to, to listen, to turn to you in repentance and sorrow and brokenness. So that in that process, we might experience the healing of your hand upon our lives. We lift up to you those who are Serving in our military, Lord, we thank you for those who have given their lives in defense of others. As we have celebrated the birth of our nation, we thank you that so many, many came just to be able to worship you without being told by the govern government how to do it and why to do it and where to do it. But just the freedom to be able to draw near to you in a way that is precious to ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, if we have lost sight of that as a nation. The desire to worship the living God in the way that we understand, the way that meets our own needs and desires to express the worship of our hearts. Lord, we need revival in our country today. We need your hand to continue to be upon us, to draw us close to your heart, so that we might be a people who have been changed and redeemed, a people of love and peace. We pray that you would help us as a church to be the people you're calling us to be. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, our King and Savior, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. 
Let me remind you to be sure and fill out one of the grace notes that is in your bulletin and drop that in the offering plate on your way out at the main entrances. And uh, we thank you for the gifts that have been given online for the sustaining of the continuing ministry of our church. And if you want, you can place a gift in the offering envelope as well, uh, the grace note. There's a place for prayer requests and uh, prayer groups are praying over your needs and that word is going out. And so we thank you for your faithfulness in that. Let's have a prayer over our offering this morning. Lord, thank you for the many gifts that have been provided and will be provided. You provide through your people in so many ways. And Lord, it's a privilege and an honor for us to hear your call to respond as good stewards, as good caretakers of that which you have placed in our hands. We ask that you would bless our gift, use it to touch the lives of many here in our community and even around the world. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
Now let us sing together hymn number 462, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." May the grace and the mercy of Jesus, our King, be with you. You're his ambassadors to a hurting world. Go in his name. Amen. <laughs> 